you may not remember exactly when you first became aware that this life is going to end someday. But ever since that day, you have at least occasionally wondered. And as you grew older and are approaching this time of the inevitable leave-taking, you may find yourself wondering more and more often. It has been said that there are only two things that are certain, death and taxes. This is only about half right. Sometimes people can escape taxes. No one escapes death. It is not something that most of us like to think about all that much. But if we are honest with ourselves, we will admit that it is something that is never very far from our thoughts. For most of us, when we contemplate a journey into a far country, we deem it prudent that certain precautions be taken and information be gathered about the destination. These precautions are likely to include questions such as, what are conditions like within the country? What documents are going to be required? Are there immunizations needed? What is the language and the coin of the realm? What are travel conditions like within the destination country? We may even spend some time perusing little travel guides and language books or looking at maps. We try to find people who have been there recently. We question them and ask them to give their impressions. We talk excitedly with our friends about the coming trip. Friends gather around to wish us well and we have farewell parties. No one tells us that it is morbid to think about our coming adventure. The situation is quite different when we contemplate our coming demise. Friends encourage us with statements like, you're going to live forever, and you're looking good. There is no talk about our coming journey. Everything is done to take our attention from the coming changes. We are cautioned against entertaining an unhealthy train of thought. Most of us are happy to have our attention diverted in these ways. But maybe you are different. Maybe you have wondered, what is it going to be like on that day when you close your eyes for the last time? Is it going to be like a long sleep, dreamless and peaceful? Are you going to be aware of what is going on around you in those last moments? Are there any new experiences? Will your consciousness persist or will there be a blank nothingness? If it is a blank nothingness, then of course there is nothing more to be said. But what if your consciousness continues? What might your new state be like? Will you remember those you have left behind? Will you meet loved ones who have gone before? Will you meet those whom you have hurt in the past or who have hurt you? Will the strained relationships continue? Will there be a possibility of reconciliation? Will there be angels or demons? A literal heaven or a literal hell? Flames or celestial harps? What will it be like? At this time we are not going to ponder the details of such possible future consciousness after death. Rather, we are going to look into how your questions echo those of other humans, and other than humans, who have considered this question of the possibility of after-death consciousness, and what conclusions they seem to have reached. For one thing is certain, you are not alone when you wonder about these questions. All through recorded history, these questions have continually occupied the thoughts and emotions of humans. Kings and queens, royalty and commoners, rich and poor, saints and sinners, judges and pirates, all the beautiful people and all the ordinary people of history have wondered. My favorite philosopher, Woody Allen, puts it this way. I am not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Probably most of us could say that we feel the same way. 
There is evidence that these questions go back to long before there was any writing. Archaeologists have been busily digging up evidence that points to human preoccupation with questions about death. And not only humans. The first group we want to look at is the Neanderthals. They are named for the Neanderthal in Germany. Thal is the German word for valley. The first remains of the Neanderthals were found in this valley. They roamed the earth from about 600,000 BCE to around 50 or 30,000 BCE. They stood about 5 feet 6 inches tall, and their brain sizes at birth were about the same as the brain sizes of Homo sapiens, that is, humans. The adult Neanderthal had a brain size somewhat larger than the human, leaving us with the question, were they more intelligent than the humans that lived concurrently with them? If so, why did humans survive and why did the Neanderthals die out? The Neanderthal were cousin to humans, and they seem to have been here on Earth somewhat before we Homo sapiens made our appearance. There even seem to be some genetic linkages between Neanderthals and humans. Possibly there was some interbreeding between the two strains of bipeds. When archaeologists dig up Neanderthal graves, they find that there are definite signs of intentional internment. It took archaeologists more than 50 years after the discovery of the first Neanderthals to reach the conclusion that the burials were deliberate and meaningful to the Neanderthals. Anthropologist and archaeologist Louis Leakey was the first to reach this conclusion. In both Europe and the Near East, Neanderthal cadavers appear to be placed in dugout graves in sleeping or fetal positions, as if they were being readied for a future rebirth. This seems to hint that there may have been some sort of a belief that death was a kind of a sleep state, a rest before rebirth. These ritualistic burials indicate very strongly that there was some sort of a belief in survival or of a future life. Sometimes plants or flowers had been placed in the hands of the Neanderthals, giving the appearance of a deliberate arrangement. Sometimes there is a red pigment marking the graves, which suggests some kind of symbolic meaning. Apparently family and friends gathered horsetails and other plants, carried them to the grave, and carefully placed them on the body. Sometimes corn flowers and grape hyacinths were gathered, along with other flowers and plants with known curative and anti-inflammatory properties. It is not known whether the Neanderthals were aware of the medicinal properties of the plants or whether they were coincidental choices. Some Neanderthals are buried in groups, suggesting some kind of family relationships. Occasionally, there are stone slabs over the graves. Some are buried with food and tools. This, again, strongly indicates some sort of an idea of an afterlife. It seems as if the expectation was that after-death conditions were very much like those of life. And there are indications that after the time of the latest Neanderthals and before the earliest Greeks, there was a continuing belief in human survival. These are mostly not in the form of written records, but in the rituals that surrounded human burial, as evidenced by archaeology. From the time of the earliest writings, there are abundant indications that the earliest civilizations had customs and performed rituals that indicated that there was some sort of a belief in the continued consciousness of the departed individuals. During the time of the pre-Socratic philosophers in Greece, among these were Parmenides, Heraclitus, Empedocles, and Pythagoras, from 520 BCE to 430 BCE, people were thinking about what happens when they die, 
and there are even records of attempts to contact those who had passed on. Parmenides and many others had traveled to the far world and talked and written about it, and you can guess what they meant by the far world. We are often told that the Greeks spent time in earnest cogitation, but were not especially adept at experimenting to prove or disprove their thinking. They were not scientific in our modern view of such things. They were content with a sort of woolly-headed mysticism far from the hard-headed practical and successful approach of modern scientists. They actually experimented quite a lot, but most of their experimentation was in the areas of the non-physical, what we might now call psychological or even spiritual. This sort of experimentation is reminiscent of Einstein's Gedanken experiments, which could be translated as thought experiments, and which Einstein used to derive both the special and general theories of relativity. Einstein was famous for arriving at some of his most far-reaching conclusions through these thought experiments. There is, therefore, nothing strange or unusual or worthy of contempt about the Greek way of arriving at their conclusions. Newton, for instance, derived his laws of gravity by the use of mathematics and observations of the celestial objects made by others, without experimenting with any physical objects to come to his conclusions. It was observation and conclusions. It seems that they knew, on the basis of their far world travels, that the physical world is an illusion anyhow. It was a temporary state of some use in the growth of consciousness in experiencing itself, but it was not the be-all and end-all. Hence, experimenting in the physical world was not the most essential activity. In their view, if the higher, non-physical world could be investigated and understood, it would give adequate insights into the lower-level physical world where needed, without the need for extraordinary playing around with physical objects. It is interesting to note that most of the wonderful discoveries of the last centuries were already previsioned two millennia ago by the Greeks. Sometimes our modern study of physics seems to corroborate their philosophical views to a much greater extent than the earlier intellectual and experimental gropings of physical science. Quantum mechanics comes to mind here. String theory, a modern way of viewing the world, has negligible experimental backing at present, but is taken seriously nevertheless by many physicists simply on logical grounds. Some physicists tend to discount it on this account. The energies required to investigate matter at the very minute distances that would be required for such investigations are so large that it is doubtful whether human technology will ever attain such power. So experimentation seems out of the question with our present technologies. But the complete understanding of the universe requires that we know what happens at these minute distances, and since there seems no way forward using experimental methods, we are required to use our intelligence instead. Mathematics is helpful and can be useful both as a crutch and a flashlight, but could be misleading also. There is, however, the hope that someday there may be some experimental evidence found for string theory, perhaps in cosmology. The Greek way of thinking of the spiritual as being more basic to reality than the physical world has its reflection in the growing realization of modern physics that consciousness is the basic stuff of the universe and that the physical is a creation of consciousness rather than the other way around. Modern studies of the mind seem to be going in the same direction because some major mind researchers are coming to the conclusion that it is not the physical brain that creates consciousness, but that consciousness creates the physical brain. More to be said about this in a later part of this series of video presentations.
To return to Greece, Herodotus, the first known historian, writes about Zalmoxis. Zalmoxis had been enslaved for some reason, and he was, in a sense, fortunate to become a slave of Pythagoras, who believed in the continuation of life beyond death. And Pythagoras seems to have spent much time with Zalmoxis discussing human survival. Apparently, Zalmoxis was eventually freed, and he left Greece for a time, and when he returned, he had become a wealthy man. He was a strong believer in life after death, and he spent his fortune in educating the Greeks about the meaning of death. Apparently, he became very well beloved by his Greek neighbors. Herodotus tells us he had an underground cavern built with food and provisions for a long stay. Then Zalmoxis talked to his fellow Greeks, telling them that death is nothing to be feared and that he would prove this to them. He then went underground, disappearing for about three years, never showing his face to anyone above ground, but reappearing at the end of the three years to the joy of the Greeks. In this way, he hoped to show them that death was nothing more than a separation with an eventual reuniting. As already stated, the Greeks mourned Zamoxis when he went underground. They went through the well-known stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, and they were overjoyed when he reappeared. Zalmoxis believed that he had proved his point. Whether this is a true story or not, and we all know that not all history is true, it indicates clearly that the Greeks believed in a life beyond the death of the physical body. The Greeks accepted communication of the living with the dead. Dr. Raymond Moody tells of a visit to a psychomantium in Greece. He even gives precise directions to prospective tourists so they can visit an ancient psychomantium even today. He tells us that Soterios Dakaris, a modern-day archaeologist, has excavated an ancient Greek psychomantium. Dr. Moody wonders whether the story of Plato's cave, by which Plato hoped to illustrate how humans are unaware of the true reality of our existence by showing humans chained in a cave with their backs to the entrance and able to see only dancing shadows on the wall of the cave, may be based in part on such psychomantia. The psychomantium of which Dr. Moody writes seems to have been frequented by a great many people in order to visit or communicate with their beloved dead relatives. It was an underground cave in which there would have been a large metal cauldron which Dr. Moody believes was used as the mirror in which the living viewed the dead. Perhaps the dead appeared to come from out of the cauldron to communicate. It is also possible that the cauldron was filled with some sort of liquid that was used much as modern-day crystal balls to see images of the dead loved ones. In this way, the psychomantium served as a meeting point between the living and the dead. Homer gives a graphic description of a ceremony for summoning the dead that didn't require the elaborate facilities and rituals that were found at psychomantiums. He accounts that Odysseus sailed to an oracle that was consecrated to this activity. Here he dug a shallow pit that he then filled with the blood from a sacrificial ewe and ram, a pool of blood into which he gazed and communicated with the spirits. To quote Homer, Then the souls of the dead who had passed away came up in a crowd from Erebus, young men and brides, old men who had suffered much, and tender maidens to whom sorrow was a new thing, others killed in battle, warriors clad in blood-stained armor. All this crowd gathered about the pit from every side with a dreadful great noise which made me pale with fear. Following this encounter, Odysseus has a conversation with his mother, who, unbeknownst to him, has died in a faraway land. Odysseus assumes that his mother's death has been a violent one, 
or perhaps one brought about by lingering illness, but she denies both of these possible causes. It was no disease that made me pine away, says his mother, but I missed you so much, and your clever wit and your gay merry ways, and life was sweet no longer, so I died. When I heard this, I longed to throw my arms around her neck, says Odysseus. Three times I tried to embrace the ghost. Three times it slipped through my hands like a shadow or a dream. The psychomantium that Dr. Moody writes about was destroyed in 280 BCE by the Romans. After that, a Christian Byzantine chapel was built above it, most likely to hide it. When Christianity made its debut, many such ancient sites were either destroyed or hidden from view, and this also includes the burning of books and libraries to erase all knowledge that might contradict the new Christian teachings. Christianity could not easily prosper if the truth were allowed to continue to be readily available. For the Egyptians, there were always two worlds interconnecting or coexisting, the physical world and the far world. These two worlds intertwined, like the two snakes of the caduceus, or the double helix of genetics. You could not readily speak about one without mentioning the other. This is very reminiscent of the dualities of physics, of which the wave-particle duality is a well-known example. These dualities are very common in physics and probably also apply to the spiritual realms. For the Egyptians, the physical realm existed within time and the far world existed outside of time. All the energies and vitalities of the physical world had their source in the far world, what we would term the spiritual world. Life itself came from this far world. The physically dead were understood to be the truly living ones. Modern mystics such as Swedenborg claim to have visited this far world and told of some of its characteristics. Iamblichus, a philosopher from Syria, had a great interest in the spiritual beliefs and practices of the Egyptians. He was a Neoplatonist. He lived in the 3rd century AD. He was teaching theurgy, which is probably best translated as working with the gods, as contrasted with theology, which would be talking or studying about the gods. He was much more interested in practical effects than in intellectual argument. He wanted his students to know rather than just believe. He was very open about the ability of the Egyptian priests to separate their consciousness from their body and enter the far world. And he did not just imply this. He was explicit. There was to be no possibility of misunderstanding or misinterpretation. He states that the priests did not have their knowledge of the divine realms, to quote him, by mere reason alone. This is a direct challenge to the popular teaching of Aristotle, who believed that intellect alone could reach the higher realms. It is also very far removed from the latter-day Christian teaching that belief is the key to heaven. Iamblichus claimed that in the Egyptian teaching it was possible for the spiritual part of the human being to separate from the physical part. He appears to have understood the spiritual and the physical to be two distinct kinds of reality. He says that in the Egyptian teaching, at the point of death, the individual soul goes forth in an out-of-body experience in a spontaneous way. As Iamblichus described it, this can also be done by a healthy individual in the living state. This projection requires some induction, some initiation or some kind of ritual. Scholars are still puzzled about an interesting ritual that was performed by the priests in the temples. The ancient texts say that a priest would sit in a quiet place and use some sort of techniques that would induce something that could be translated as sleep. 
it appears in this context to refer to something more like a trance or a meditative state. Perhaps it was a hypnotic state of some kind. This ritual appeared to result in the priest moving into the world of the dead, the far world. On his return from this state, he was able to describe his experience as a dead person. This process is often referred to as an initiation. There is an interesting aspect to the teachings of Iamblichus. Going deeper into his teachings, it seems that he meant for the masses of people to perform rituals that were physical in nature, while the higher types, who were closest to the divine and whose numbers were few, could reach the divine realm through contemplation. It seems that he thought that there were different levels at which humans could approach the divine. Iamblichus was said to have been a man of great culture and learning. He was also renowned for his charity and self-denial. Many students gathered around him, and he lived with them in genial friendship. According to Fabricius, he died during the reign of Constantine, sometime before 333 AD. It was during the reign of Constantine that the Christian religion became the state religion of the Roman Empire. It was at this point that Christianity began its ascendancy in numbers of believers and decline in spiritual power. Soon it included just war theories and other signs of retreat from the teachings of its purported icon, Jesus. At the Monroe Institute in the States, a form of out-of-body experience is taught, making use of some modern psychological knowledge. This seems to be a modern form of the Egyptian initiations. In the intervening years between the time of the Greeks and the 1860s, there are many references in the literature to various forms of communication with the departed. There are some early references in the Old Testament to various forms of necromancy. There is a story of Saul visiting the witch of Ender, sometimes called the medium of Ender, a woman who apparently called up the ghost of the recently deceased prophet Samuel at the demand of King Saul of the kingdom of Israel, as related in the first book of Samuel. As the story goes, after Samuel had died, he was buried in Ramah. After Samuel's death, Saul received no more answers from God in dreams through prophets or via the Urim and Thummim as to his best course of action against the assembled forces of the Philistines. Consequently, Saul, who had earlier driven out all necromancers and magicians from Israel, seeks out a medium, anonymously and in disguise. Following the instruction of her visitor, the woman claims that she sees the ghost of Samuel rising from the abode of the dead. The voice of the prophet's ghost, after some complaining about being disturbed, berates Saul for disobeying God and predicts Saul's downfall, along with his whole army, in battle the next day, then adds that Saul and his sons will join him shortly in the abode of the dead. Saul is shocked and afraid, and in the following encounter he is defeated, and Saul throws himself on his sword after being wounded. The Jewish historian Josephus, writing in the Antiquities of the Jews, quotes this story and appears to find it completely credible. The story of King Saul and the Witch of Ender would appear to affirm that it is possible for humans to summon the spirits of the dead, or at least to confirm that such belief existed. Medieval glosses to the Bible catering to Catholic interpretation suggested that what the witch actually summoned was not the ghost of Samuel, but a demon taking his shape, or an illusion crafted by the witch. There are many more cases cited in the Bible of divination and diviners. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Judge Samuel, King Saul, King David, Joseph, many high priests, and the eleven apostles after the death of Jesus, as recounted in the Acts, and John also, are presented as diviners. 
Joseph in Pharaoh's service once instructed his steward to go and find the cup that Joseph used to drink from and use for divination. The cup was found in his visiting brother Benjamin's sack. Joseph said to his shamed brothers, What is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? This is from Genesis 44. The Israelites got their various areas to live in the Holy Land assigned by Lot, as commanded through Moses in Joshua 14. Casting of lots is one form of divination. Moses instigated it among the Israelites, and Joshua carried it on. A garment-like tool called the ephod was designed to serve as a divining object. It served divination and was specified for Israelite priests and leaders in Exodus 28. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants. Judge Samuel wore the ephod when he served before the tabernacle at Shiloh, as in Samuel 2. The ephod proper was worn outside the robe. It seems to have been kept in place by a girdle and by shoulder pieces, from which hung the breastplate or pouch containing the sacred lots, the divinitary objects, the Urim and Thummim, whose precise function is now unknown. This description is found in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Thus the ephod was part of the ceremonial dress of the high priest of ancient Israel. The ephod was also used for oracular purposes, together with the two stones, Urim and Thummim. The point of citing these references is not to show that divining was a common practice. The stories may all be apocryphal. For instance, there is a question of whether there ever was a Moses. Most of the other characters, such as Joseph, may be mythical. The point is to show that there has been a belief that divining was practiced in ancient Israel. Joseph's cup was used in a form of communication, often called mirror gazing. The Tungus natives used copper mirrors in their shamanic rituals. There is a story of Aladdin's lamp, clearly another form of mirror, because when the lamp had been polished, the genie appeared. This is not exactly communication with the dead, but somewhat in the same vein. The Romans believed in water fairies, the Celts did their gazing, and in Shakespeare's Macbeth there is a calling up of apparitions. Queen Elizabeth I had her own mirror gazer. He was John Dee, who acted as a sleuth for her at various times and he is very likely the man on whom Agent 007 is modeled. Around the 1860s, an American president, Abraham Lincoln, had a precognitive dream in which he saw a vision in a mirror, which his wife interpreted as presaging his death. In the United States, Raymond Moody has created a psychomantium which many people have visited in a modern form of mirror gazing, in which they claim to be able to meet with and communicate with loved ones who have departed this earth. There is much evidence that since time immemorial death has been both celebrated and feared, giving us reason to think that there was a strong belief in the continuation of some kind of soul or consciousness after the demise of the physical body. There are some practices as closing the eyes of the dead person, thus closing off a window between the living world and the spirit world, or covering the face, or even holding the mouth and nose of the dying person shut, which were to make sure that the soul could not escape and therefore the death of the person would be delayed. Covering the face of the deceased comes from the pagan belief that the spirit of the deceased escapes through the mouth. The homes of the deceased were sometimes burned to keep the spirit from returning. At other times, the doors and windows were opened to allow the soul to escape, so that the deceased could not haunt the living who continued to live in the house. 
the dead were carried out of the home feet first, so that they could not look back into the house and beckon to those left behind to follow them. Mirrors were covered in black crepe, so that the souls of the deceased would not be trapped on this side, making it impossible to proceed to the other side. Family photographs were turned face down, so that other family members would not be possessed by the spirit of the dead. Some Saxons cut the feet off their dead, so that they could not walk abroad and disturb the living. Among some Aborigines, the practice was to cut off the heads of the deceased, so they would be kept too busy looking for their heads to give any trouble to those still in the living. The use of tombstones may come from a belief that the dead could be weighed down. Occasionally, mazes were constructed at the doors of mausoleums, apparently on the theory that the dead could only travel in straight lines they could thus be kept at bay. Sometimes funeral processions were arranged in such a way that the path to the cemetery was different from the path back from the cemetery. This was meant to keep the deceased from being able to find their way to the homes of the living. Some of the rituals which we now perform as a sign of respect for the dead had their origin in fear of the dead. Beating on the grave, the firing of guns, and other noisy or violent acts may have originated in an attempt to frighten away other spirits at the cemetery. In many cemeteries, most of the graves are oriented in such a way that the feet of the dead are to the east and the heads to the west. This may have originated in ancient times with sun worshippers but at present it is most likely associated with the belief that the trumpets calling the dead to judgment will be coming from the East. Mourning clothing comes from a practice designed to disguise the living so that the dead would be confused and leave the living in peace. Feasting probably comes from the practice of early societies leaving food offerings for their deceased. Wakes originated in an ancient practice of keeping watch over the deceased, hoping that life would return. The lighting of candles originates from the practice of using fire to protect the living from the spirits of the dead. The ringing of bells comes from the medieval belief that the ringing of consecrated bells will keep the spirits at bay. The firing of guns mirrors the ancient practice of throwing spears into the air to ward off spirits hovering over the deceased. Holy water was sprinkled over the deceased to protect them from demons. Floral offerings are often intended to gain favor with the spirit of the deceased. Funeral music began with ancient chants designed to placate the spirits. From these practices, we can clearly see that there was a strong belief in the survival of the soul or spirit of the individual, and that there was a possibility of interaction between the dead and the living. Often this possibility was a source of fear and dread for the living. There is not too much evidence for the attitude of the dead. As we can see, there has been a very long-term belief in the survival of the human spirit, but this is often seen as a one-sided intrusion of spirits into the land of the living, and often with fearful consequences for the living, if one is to believe the fearful propaganda. Any weekend on television is replete with horrifying tales of the murder and mayhem perpetrated by spirits of the dead on the living, and of course, some of those who have died have left legacies that no doubt now keep them busily turning over in their graves with regret. But the living today are really the ones to be feared. One has only to spend a little bit of time with the daily news to see how much horrific mayhem is being perpetrated in the name of all that is holy and just. 
Even the icon of Christianity, Jesus, must be horrified when contemplating the endless follies of racism and the destruction of the lives of apparently innocent men, women, and children, especially children, that are perpetrated in his name and putatively for the sake of propagating his good news. And the Buddha and the Hindu gods and Zoroaster and all the spirits of all the ancient tribes and cultures through the ages must be similarly agitated. No wonder that an apparently impenetrable veil seems to have been interposed between the living and the dead. If there is indeed such a veil, then this is no doubt more for the protection of the dead than of the living. It is no wonder that we humans walk about, bowed under the weight of the guilt over the things that we have done, are doing, and will no doubt continue to do in the foreseeable future, all in the name of everything that we hold to be noble and holy. And in 1848, three sisters, Leah, Margaret, and Kate, appeared on the scene, and the world has not been quite the same since. This phenomenon has been debated for years, and there is no clear evidence for either side. There are those who believe that the Fox sisters reopened the door for us to enter the realm of the departed, and those who fervently debunk this point of view. Whatever the truth, there were wrappings and table tippings, mysterious lights and answers to human questions purporting to come from the other side. Before long, most of American society, from the upper crust of Boston to the lower east side of New York, was tipping and bumping and raising a riot of holy and occasionally unholy psychical fun. By 1888, the girls confessed publicly that the whole thing had started with a joke meant to frighten their mother, that it was all fraudulent. They now said, when we went to bed at night, we used to tie an apple to a string and move the string up and down, causing the apple to bump on the floor. Or we would drop the apple on the floor, making a strange noise every time it would rebound. Mother listened to this for a time. She would not understand it and did not suspect us as being capable of a trick because we were so young. The account went on to say, during the night of March 31st, Kate challenged the invisible noisemaker, presumed to be a spirit, to repeat the snaps of her fingers. It did. It was asked to wrap out the ages of the girls. It did. The neighbors were called in, and over the course of the next few days, a type of code was developed where raps could signify yes or no in response to a question, or be used to indicate a letter of the alphabet. The girls addressed the spirit as Mr. Splitfoot, which is a nickname for the devil. Later, the alleged entity created the sounds claimed to be the spirit of a peddler named Charles B. Rosma, who had been murdered five years earlier and buried in the cellar. Doyle claims the neighbors dug up the cellar and found a few pieces of bone, but it wasn't until 1904 that a skeleton was found buried in the cellar wall. No missing person named Charles B. Rosma was ever identified. A year later, just to add to the fun, they denied their confession. This greatly excited the participants. The believers were taken aback, the pseudo-skeptics were delighted, and the skeptics were thoroughly confused after that. But this is only one of many conflicting accounts. The arguments have been going pro and con ever since. The girls fell out of favor with each other at various times and appeared to have told various stories, and the situation became more bizarre. At this distance and time from the events, and considering the heat of the emotions generated, there does not appear to be any clear-cut indication as to the truth of the allegations and counter-allegations. One would think that these shenanigans would have made people shy away from the phenomena, but such does not appear to be the case. If anything, the controversies added to the fun, 
and word-of-mouth advertising is always the most effective. And since most people are either hoping to see the reality of psychic phenomena established or are hoping for its opposite, with very few people simply trying to establish the truth of the situation in an unbiased manner, there is not likely to be an early end to the controversies. At any rate, the phenomenon blossomed and grew and the stories multiplied. All manner of psychic abilities were now in evidence. The Fox sisters' phenomenon seemed to have opened a gigantic floodgate. It was as if the world had been waiting for some kind of return to the earlier belief in spirits and sprites and demons and angels. The so-called scientific revolution had tended to tamp down the natural belief of human beings in another world, but the beliefs were clearly never very far submerged. And this avalanche of fascination with the doings of the spirit world also flowed over into Europe and England. Almost everyone, including people like Carl Jung, indulged in at least some experimentation with this new phenomenon. The original Fox sisters who started it all did not fare too well. They had their time of fame and fortune with many revering them while others threw cabbages and threatened to lynch them. At least one of them ended up eventually on the tipsy, poor, and lonely side of life. This was the beginning of modern spiritualism. In retrospect, it has many of the more entertaining aspects of a good modern election campaign or religious revival. But there was at the same time a new spirit in the modern world. As already mentioned, materialism had been on a very steady march since Newton and the Industrial Revolution, but Isaac Newton's insights and the advance of technology had also spurred a new spirit of adventure and experimentation along psychological lines. And almost everyone was now aware that it was possible to acquire knowledge about one's surroundings by careful observation and some cogitation. There was a new sense of the power of the human mind to probe nature, and perhaps also to acquire knowledge in areas that had hitherto merely inspired belief. Scientists now began to study the phenomenon and its phenomena, and some came to the conclusion that there was something to the non-materialist side of life, something that needed serious investigation. There was much controversy, but there also seemed to be some evidence coming forward to confirm the ancient belief that there was indeed more to life and death than the new age of scientific materialism was willing to show an interest in or able to accommodate. It became evident that not all phenomena were visible to the naked eye, as the microscope and the telescope and the advent of radio waves and their application to communication had by now made clear. What else might lie beyond the scope of the ordinary five senses? Although it was still rather dangerous to the reputation and career of any scientific investigator to engage openly in such study, there were very reputable and trusted people who were willing to take the chance with their reputations and who came forward and confirmed in undeniable language that there was something to the psychic. Between 1860 and 1919, numerous other researchers joined the quest. More or less in order of their appearance, we will look at the work of a few of them. The year in which each one of them began his work is shown in the accompanying slide. I include mainly researchers who were known to Dr. Hamilton during the years when he was doing his own psychic investigations. In the next video, we will take a brief look at the work of each of these researchers.